Hello there, I'm Laura Lee. Thanks for tuning in to Conversation for Exploration. Tonight, Jordan Mike Maxwell joins us. He says that our modern world, yes, rests squarely upon our historical world, but he's here tonight to detail some of the arcane and forgotten ways in which the ancient mindset informs our present-day institutions. Welcome, Jordan. What a subject we uh, we have embarked upon. What a subject we've embarked upon. Yeah. This it's has occupied you for how many years now? In 40 years I have been involved in researching and studying the subject of occultism in politics and religion and institutions. Uh-huh. And by occultism I mean the uh, classic understanding of the word occult in Latin means uh, that which is hidden. And so much uh, in our world that we live in is hidden from us. We use terms and words and phrases and see symbols and emblems all around us. And so much of it is hidden to us. We don't really understand <clears throat> why we use certain terms and why we use certain words. And most people are just not very well informed as to how the entire world really works. And uh, so the word occult does not mean evil or bad it just means hidden is it mean forgotten because once everyone was well aware of what uh, some of these connections uh, were but we've just forgotten over time yeah well or were they hidden in the first place well i can give you some examples uh (coughs) most people are frightened to death when they're summoned to court and that never most likely has never occurred to anyone why do you even call that thing a court why do you go to court? Because you play basketball on a court. Uh huh. You know, you play tennis on a court. Right. Uh, the reason why it's called a court is because it's basically a game, and the idea is that the judge is a referee, and the whole idea is to put the ball back in the other guy's court. Oh, uh, I see. Consequently, uh, it's a fascinating study of words and terms. Um, let me give you a better example. There are two kinds of laws in the world. Now, very few people even have heard of this, but there are only two kinds of law on the earth. One is called civil law, and it comes from the word civili, uh, which is a Latin term. Civil law is the law of the culture of the people that live in the country. And so, therefore, it's referred to in law as uh, civil law is referred to as the law of the land. Okay. So that's where people live, is on the land. However, there is another law which also operates on earth, and incidentally, the law of the land is different in every country, of course, because in every country, the culture is different. So you can do things in Russia you can't do in Africa, or you can do things in uh, Spain that you can't do in, in England. So... It's according to the custom of the people decides what is referred to as uh, civil law or the law of the land. Now, there's a higher law which governs the whole earth, but that's a law that none of us uh, seem to be very well acquainted with, and that is called the law of the high seas. The law of the high seas? Yes. The law of the high seas is the most powerful law on the face of the earth. There is nothing over it, nothing. It's the most powerful law existing on the earth called the law of the high seas. It goes all the way back, as far back as the Sumerian and Babylonian empires. It was perfected under the Roman Empire, and it has come down to us from Rome today. It is still enforced the same way uh, as it started out in Sumeria some 7,000 years ago. Uh Uh, to uh, the Roman Empire um, some 3,000 years ago. And today, England and America and the entire world of mankind operates under a world law, which is referred to as the law of the high seas or international maritime admiralty. Oh, now it's been renamed to International Maritime Admiralty. Right. What does it say, and who would enforce this? And what about landlocked countries? Are they bound by this if they don't have access to the high seas? Uh, no, they're not. They, they, all nations live under it. All nations. 
says who? Because. Do they have to agree to it? Is it like a treaty? Yes. It, it's, no, it's not really a treaty. It has been understood. It was laid down by the ancient powers of the world and the prehistoric and the ancient world and pretty well uh, codified by the time it reached Egypt. <clears throat> and from Egypt uh, and its influence on Rome and Rome and, of course, Greece and uh and then into the modern day world, basically what uh, the law of the high seas or the maritime admiralty law is, yeah. is the law of money, the law of international banking. Because, oh, okay. you see, you can do business here in America. You can buy things from, say, Russia, import them, and turn right around and export them to another country. Right, and so all of those early cultures that traded wanted to make a law that would be bound by all the tradees. That's exactly right. Okay. That's all it is. It's just a banking law that uh, establishes an absolute bottom line for the whole earth to do business. It doesn't matter what your currency is worth or who you are or what your culture or color or, or your background of your country. It doesn't matter. We're doing business. If you're doing business, we're talking about banks. What does the law say? What is it? What's on its books? Well, it's called the Law of Maritime Admiralty. And, um, <clears throat> goodness, um, where would you start? Let me give you an example. Well, just a, a, when a little... ship pulls into port in, say, Los Angeles and New York, uh, say from Japan with uh, $50 million worth of televisions, uh, it's coming in on water to start with. Mm -hmm. Consequently, it is also um, bringing products for the exchange of money. So banks are involved. Uh, American banks are going to have to uh, pay up to the Japanese banks who finance the Japanese industry, so banks are being paid or paying each other. Consequently, if Japan <clears throat> sends us materials, and Americans uh, decide we don't want to pay Japan for whatever reason. Sears and Roebuck decide they don't want to pay Japan for the $50 million in television they sent. Uh, what is Japan going to do? Well, virtually okay. nothing. Because However, merchandise is over here, and they really don't have say on the law of the land. Yes. So exactly. that's why they invoke the law of the high seas. Or that's this. exactly right. Mm -hmm. now, you got, now you have serious, serious problems because now uh, the corporation – that accepted the contract and accepted the goods and did not pay for them, now they have offended international maritime admiralty law, and you don't do that. Uh-huh, that's a big no-no. <laughs> you don't mess with the banks. Uh -huh. You can mess with your friends across the street and have little enemies around town, but you don't mess with the international banks. You owe them, you pay them, period. What, are they like the mafia or something? Uh, they shake you uh, down? Well, I mean, the same people who founded the mafia founded the modern-day international banking cartels back in the 9th and 10th century. They were called the Templars, the Knights of the Temple of Solomon. Oh, right, Templars. because they wanted to know how to transfer their own gold, not in physical form where someone could rob them along the crusade routes. You got it. But so that they could make it to Jerusalem and then have their funds transferred there. And, and it worked out so well that there became a, a camaraderie among nations and bankers and traders uh, all over the Middle East, all over the Near East, and finally into Europe, but where, people were, uh, go ahead. where everyone understood how this thing works. But they were traders um, long before they were Freemasons. Oh, of course. I understand that. As I said, it goes back to 7,000 years old Ideas, scenario. sciences, yeah. institutions do what we call mutate. They evolve, and as they evolve, different people pick them up and evolve them higher and higher, um, obviously. But I'm saying that the way that we do banking today uh, goes back to the 9th and 10th century in the Anglo-Saxon world, in the English-speaking English world. You did see that. Our, the Templars were so successful, they got one of those kings after them to, out to destroy them and nab their wealth, too. Well, that's exactly the problem. Then they went underground. Yeah. Well, anyway, let me go back to the to the proposition that Japan brings in, say, fifty million dollars worth of televisions, and they're on board the ship. And consequently, that's why we use the word today when you're going to send a product to the mail, you're going to ship it to them. I see, even if it goes by air. Uh huh. 
You know, because you well, that's what a plane is. It's an airship. Right. Or one that goes to the moon is a rocket ship. That's why in the Enterprise they call it the bridge. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, the ship pulls in from Japan, say, and it, it's coming in on water with products which are going to cause money to change hands. Therefore, the ship pulls into <clears throat> and parks where it's supposed to, and when it parks, it is referred to as in its uh, in its berth. It's called berthing a ship. So the ship now sits in its berth, uh, which is next to the dock. It has to be tied to the dock. And now <clears throat> the first thing the captain has to do, because we're talking about money now, we're talking about banking, it has nothing to do with who came into this country or what the culture is here. We're talking about money. Consequently, the captain of the ship uh, has to provide the the, uh, the port authorities with a certificate of manifest or a certificate showing what he is bringing in to sell and do business in this country. Right. So therefore, he has to have a certificate of manifest showing what it is he has brought into the economy of this country and how much is it going to make and how much do we have to pay. Now, so we can calculate our gross national product. Yeah. Exactly. That's uh-huh. it. And so consequently, many people do not realize that when you were born, you came out of your mother's water. And consequently, you were a maritime admiralty product by law because you came out of water. You came down your mother's birth canal. <laughs> consequently, <laughs> it sounds silly, but in point of fact, it's lawfully correct that since you came out of your mother's water, you are a maritime product. You are what is referred to as a national product. (laughs) I'm a commodity. (laughs) A commodity. You know, you are, that's why if you're unemployed, you go to the uh, human resource. Unemployment, you're a resource, Uh like uh, televisions and radio and anything else that can make us money. Uh You're a resource. Now, this is why when you were born... The doc uh, has to sign your birth certificate. <laughs> um, Just like my man, the manifest of a ship. Um. Of course, it, that's all it is. It's a it's a it's a maritime admiralty manifest showing um, that your mother brought you into the world and you were going to make money. It doesn't matter how much. The fact is, you're going to make and use and make money. Consequently, you are a maritime admiralty product. Hmm. Uh, to show you the difference between maritime admiralty, uh, the law of the water, and the law of the land, which yeah. is a uh, civil law, um, the Statue of Liberty could not be put on American land by law. It had to be put in water. So they had to build up that place out there called the island uh, for them to put the Statue of Liberty on because it, by law it could not be put on American land. Huh. The reason why is because the Statue of Liberty is not the Statue of Freedom. It's the Statue of Liberty. Liberty is what a sailor gets when he pulls into port and the Navy. The Navy owns you. If you join any military uh, establishment, you are, in point of fact, a GI, a government issue. You are owned as a piece of property. For the time you're in there, you are property. And consequently, uh, you know, if you have a fleet of cars, they are your property as a corporation. But if one of them gets uh, tore up in an accident, so what? So you take it off the operating expenses. Uh, You don't cry about it. If you have uh, whatever it is that you're losing in business, you just take it off your taxes. Well, and any time a military person gets killed, there's nothing to cry about. It's just a piece of property. So you just take it off of the taxes, and it's a maritime admiralty product, and the entire thing is a piece of business. It's nothing, uh, you know, it's nothing personal. Now, <clears throat> once you understand that you are a maritime admiralty product, um, if you if you order a big refrigerator or some large item from, say, Sears, and um, they, and you can't take it with you in the car, well, then you have to uh, wait till they deliver the next day. Well, this is what your mother did. She delivered you in the delivery room because she was delivering a product and um, under maritime law. Now, all of this is, uh, is just academic, and it's interesting if, to some people. Most people couldn't care less about it. 
because they don't see the profound significance of it. But uh, it's when you get into court, when you are stopped by the policeman, when you get the bill from the Internal Revenue, or you get a subpoena to court, or or get yourself in some serious trouble, now it becomes important for the first time in your life to understand how you got in trouble hmm. and how to get out of it. Well, you got in trouble because you are a maritime admiralty product. So when you go to court, the judge is a referee, and the referee will sit and listen to both players on both sides of the courtroom, and uh, the whole idea, as I said, is to put the ball back in the other guy's court, and at the end, the, the judge will decide who won the battle and who won the game. Mm -hmm. Now, he sits on the bench, which is a maritime admiralty term. The judges rule from the bench. The word bench is a Latin word for bank. Oh, really? So if you went to the bank in the Roman Empire, you went to the bench. And consequently, the judge rules for the bank because he sits on the bench. Hmm. And uh, he wears a black robe. Why do judges wear black robes? They look Almost distinguished and dignified? Well, it looks like it's important. It looks, makes it look official. No, it has nothing to do with looking official. Black robes have to do with a secret society or a brotherhood that's come down to us for the past 6,000 years. Hmm. It's called the Saturnalian Brotherhood. The Saturnalian Brotherhood or the law of the planet Saturn. Saturn now comes into the picture of maritime admiralty. This goes all the way back to, as I said, the old Phoenician Canaanite Sumerians uh, was picked up in uh, Greece and Rome and uh, even the Nazis uh, wore black robes. Um, and in England, of course, the lords wear black robes. And in America, our judges still wear black robes. Uh, it's, uh, it's a startling and profound story when you understand how courts work. Um, and how do you determine what is civil and what is maritime admiralty? Well, first of all, if any money is changed hands or has changed hands which caused the problem, uh, you're talking about maritime admiralty. Anything where money changes hands is now business. And um, this brings into play maritime admiralty. So this is different than damages. So if somebody breaks something in your storefront and you right. wanted to get reimbursed, this is that's civil law. No, no, that's maritime admiralty. Because, because money, money is going to change hands, or... Well, isn't that the case in most suits? Say it again. Isn't that the case in most suits, that there's some dollar amount attached to it somehow, somewhere? No. No, any time something like that happens, you go into court, and uh, you can plead your case uh, one way or the other, but it is still being heard officially under maritime admiralty and not under civil. So much of our laws have been, uh, even the law of the land has now been transferred under the law of maritime admiralty because the corporation called United States went bankrupt in 1930 under maritime admiralty. Um, I should stipulate this, that back in the 1870s, right after the Civil War quieted down, a group of men got together and incorporated a privately owned corporation or a company. Well, of course, anyone can. Well, this group of men got together and they incorporated a company, and they called the company, very clever, they called their company uh, United States Company. And consequently, uh, they stipulated that if anyone be a member of that company, or working for that company, they would be called not an employee, but a citizen. And so very cleverly today, if someone asks you in a bank or filling out an application, are you a citizen of the United States? What you think that they are asking you is, are you lawfully and legally in America <clears throat> to do business? But they're not asking you if you're in America. <clears throat> they ask you if you are a citizen of the United States, meaning the maritime law, not whatever you thought it meant, but what in fact it means. Where are you getting all this, Jordan? Out of my, where am I getting it? <laughs> where, you know, this is, this is, 
I, I don't know. I'm just going, is this in the history books? Is this being, <laughs> where is this? Well, it's all over. you got to go to the library and get, a, get, get reference books on maritime law, uh-huh. international maritime admiralty law. And this is all explained in there? Well, I mean, it's not all explained in You're putting one the book. Together. It's, uh, you know, it's like anything else. Um, is the is the whole subject of physics explained in a book somewhere where I can go read it? No. Where is this corporation? You're saying that somebody put up a side by side corporation, yes, then sort of subsumed yes. the the U.S. Yeah, of course, and nobody knows about That's it. That's right. Absolutely. Except the people invoking it. <laughs> Yeah, but don't take it personal. It's just business. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. So consequently, <clears throat> it's like anything else. Any any good uh, detective, you know, like uh, you know, um, one of the one of my friends say, like Columbo. At the end of the movies of Columbo, he sits there and explains how he came up with the conclusions and caught the robber and caught the guy. Um, but but you think, well, how did you know that? Where did you get all this information? Well, it takes some 40 years of being experienced to know what you're looking for. Uh-huh. Uh, you have to be educated in this particular field to know what the words and symbols mean. So when you walk into the crime scene, uh, unlike the rookie, you already know what to look for. And in about 10 minutes, uh, Colombo has already sized up the situation and pretty well knows what happened here and has probably nailed down who it, who did it. Now all he has to do is put a case together and prove it. Okay, but here's the question. If you're saying that there's this occult system that supersedes all the laws that we think we operate on, exactly. and uh, but everybody has to agree to it or nobody's going to follow those laws. All laws are are somebody saying, this is the law. It's just a... a a system that you get everybody to agree to to make the thing function. Well, I don't see how a, a hidden law system, unless everybody knows about it, can even function because nobody's going to follow. If there's just a tiny group of people that are holding the reins here. Um, you know, it, it, to me it's a, contrary to the whole concept of what laws do. They're just agreed upon principles, rules of the game. Well, when you walk into... How can there be two games going on at the same time? Say it again. How can there be two games going on at the same time under two different sets of rules? Oh, heavens. Um, where have you been? Unless there's a wider number of people who are agreeing to this occult maritime law thing that you're talking about going on. I'm just asking. I'm just asking a logical question. No, I know, but I'm just saying, do you not know that when you walk into, say, a large bank in New York City like Chase Manhattan, Yeah. <coughs> excuse me, and you're going to do... A hundred million dollars worth of business. You have to know that if you're going to say open up a corporation or move your corporation funds uh, as uh, like an international uh, corporation, General Motors or whatever, you're going to have to know that you're going to need attorneys, you're going to need advisors, you're going to need a whole army of professionals to explain to the boss and explain to the stockholders how this international banking world works. You can't just walk in and put $700 million into an account and, and wire it. If you're a corporation, you, there are certain laws, regulations, rules, and you don't have to know them all, but you had better have someone hired that does know them all. Well, right, but everybody agrees that they exist and will operate under them. Well, so everybody agrees that international banking laws are... <clears throat> govern banking. And who agrees to that? The banks do. You don't have to agree to anything. The banks have already agreed to it because the banks have already connected to maritime admiralty. So you don't have to worry about how <clears throat> banks work. You don't have to worry about how the federal government works. It's there. And if you're a part of it, you'll know how it works. And if you're not, just be careful and don't get in trouble. <laughs> no, I mean, but you don't have to understand it. People don't. But you're saying to. there's a whole group of people that work the government, but then they write textbooks that explain it in an entirely different fashion. I mean, I can see some textbook error, but it, a whole. Anyway, I'm not going to argue the veracity of it. Go ahead. I want to hear this out. I understand your 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 feelings because it is a new uh, you know, it's a new subject, but that's 
That's what you run into when you're a talk show host. You run into all kinds of strange and interesting things. Go ahead. And uh, but but just mark my words that what I'm telling you is the truth, and one has only to go to a library. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, call uh, call your local bank. Don't talk to the tellers. Tellers know nothing. Talk to the head office of the bank and talk to the president of the bank and ask them if they know anything about international maritime admiralty law. Okay. And they will tell you, yes, that is the Bible for all banking on the earth, period. Interesting. Okay. And it has nothing to do with you. You don't have to worry about nothing. You just put your money in the bank every week and do your job and pay your bills and stay out of the way. Uh, the international banking cartels operating all over the earth for the past 1,600 years under the Roman Empire, uh, they will they will take care of business. They know what they're doing. It has nothing to do with you. It's actually none of your business. I was and, asking more about the corporation that called itself the U.S. That, okay. that you said superseded a constitution which we think we run on. Yeah. Um, all right. <clears throat> Let me go back to that then. Uh, the company was called United States, and anyone who works for that company is uh, referred to as a citizen of the United States. <clears throat> it does not matter if you are an American. It doesn't matter. No one's asking you when you walk into a bank to fill out a form to open an account. They didn't ask you, are you lawfully in the country called America? Are you an American or are you lawfully in this country of America as an American. Nobody ever asks you that because nobody cares about that. You're doing banking. It doesn't matter if you're mafia or if you're some Mexican slave from uh, from Mexico or if you're Don Corleone. It doesn't matter. Banks are banks for money. I mean, everybody knows that. Nobody cares where your money comes from. It could be drug money. It could be hard-earned money from picking cotton. It doesn't matter. It's just a bank. Mm -hmm. so consequently, you have to finish the story when we come back from this break. We're talking with Jordan Maxwell. We have a link to his website if you'd like to learn more. I'm Laura Lee. Laura Lee Online www.moralee.com All interviews on The Laura Lee Show are available on audio cassette. For information, call 1-800-243-1438. The sweet secret of the herb stevia lies in a complex molecule called steviocide, a glycoside composed of glucose, sophros, and steviol, a complex molecule that gives this herb from Paraguay its extraordinary sweetness, 10 to 15 times sweeter than common table sugar. But here's the really extraordinary part. Stevia does not affect blood sugar metabolism. Some studies even report that stevia reduces plasma glucose levels in normal adults. Sweet, nutritious, natural, and good for you. Wisdom of the Ancients introduces Stevia Plus. Take these little packets with you everywhere, containing powdered stevia that equals two teaspoons of sugar and sweetness. Sprinkle on food and beverages alike. I use stevia daily. Add the liquid concentrate to lemon juice and water, and you have refreshing lemonade, and decarbonated water for a soda substitute. Stevia makes any herbal tea taste sweeter and better. Stevia is good for your skin, too, applied externally. Try it. It's versatile, good for you, and sweet without the calories. Wisdom of the Ancient Stevia products are the highest quality available. Call 1-800-243-1438. We all try to watch our diet to get a balance of nutrition, but that's not always possible. There is a gap between the nutrition from the average American diet and the optimum diet for the human system. The challenge is to take care of our own health while being able to enjoy comfort foods. That's why nutritionist and biochemist Udo Erasmus developed Missing Link. It bridges this gap with foods naturally high in essential nutrients, trace minerals, vitamins, and fiber. Call 1-800-243-1438. Missing Link is a powder that you sprinkle on your food, making your food taste better, and three tablespoons daily is all you need to achieve optimum nutrition. Call 1-800-243-1438. Each bag contains a one-month supply and is only 
Call 1-800-243-1438. Laura Lee here with Jordan Maxwell. Jordan, continue. You're telling us how the ancient mindset still has quite a hold on our institutions in a very um, occult or hidden way. Yes, it's uh, it's an extraordinary story, and I agree with that. And uh, it's <clears throat> and most Americans, most people, have never thought in these terms. But that it doesn't true. mean that it's not right. It just means that most people have never thought about such things. Uh-huh. Uh huh. If we go back to, let's say, the courts to start with. Yeah. Um, the court, well, let me let me explain this, that the difference between uh, a maritime admiralty or a banking law and and civil law is night and day. There's no there's no connection at all. Um, when you get any bill, <clears throat> any bill, now follow what I'm saying, any kind of a legal, lawful um, communication from government or from any corporation, say yeah. a bill from an oil company, internal revenue bill, a subpoena to court, anything which is lawful, legal, and is business, yeah. anything in this country that you receive as a subpoena to court or a bill to the internal revenue or your oil credit card bill, whatever it is, if it's a lawful legal document of any kind, period, your name appearing on that document must be, according to maritime law, it must be in all capital letters. It cannot be upper and lower case. That's the law. Really? Therefore, any time you are sued, any time uh-huh. you get a bill from anyone, any time you get subpoenas to court or, or fined or ticketed huh. or um, sued in court, your name must appear on any and all paperwork in all capital letters. Why? Because you do not own your body. You do not own yourself. Consequently, you are a product. You are a maritime admiralty product. Someone else owns you. Therefore, you are dead to any rights. You have what is referred to in law, no leg to stand on. You have no standing. And why? Because <clears throat> all capital letters name implies that you are a maritime admiralty product. You are not a human, you're not a living entity, you're a product. Because the, you're a living entity person, the actual you is represented under law by upper and lower case name, upper and lower case. So if you sign your name, upper and lower case, yeah. everyone in law, most people don't know this, but people in law will know this represents you, your personal self in your body. Yeah. However, if they're going to sue you or send you a bill, no one can attach anything to your physical body. No one can come in, touch you, or take from you. So it has to be done lawfully and legally. Well, all law in this country, no matter what it is, civil, state, county, federal, international, all law, all law in this country and in the English-speaking world is... Uh, all law is a is a is applied to corporations, not to individuals, upper and lower case names. All law can only be applied to corporations. Hmm. It can only be applied under maritime. It can only be applied to uh, the all capital letters name. And all capital letters name means that you are a product. You are nothing more than a product. So as a living entity, you're dead. This is why when you drive by a uh, a graveyard, you will see on the tombstones, the letters on the tombstones representing the people buried there yeah. are in all capital letters. You will never see a tombstone where it uses upper and lower case letters because That's according true. to the law, uh-huh. you, if you are dead, your name is in all 
capital letters. That means you are a corporate entity, and the corporation just uh, disbanded. Last night when you died, the corporation no longer exists, so we buried the corporation. But you are a corporation. Uh -huh. Therefore, when you get a subpoena to court or you get a, um, uh, a lawsuit, your name will appear in all capital letters because all law Has to applies apply. only to corporations, period. So you're suggesting each person's a corporation, but what if they haven't gone through the rights of incorporating? No, 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 no. No, the mere fact that you are that you are a maritime admiralty product doing business, Make they sure. have uh, automatically put you under um, a corporation title. So you are a corporation whether you know it or not but you are merely a subsidiary of a larger corporation called United States. This is the way the law works. Do lawyers so know when this? You, when you sign anything with upper and lower case, you're signing for yourself, your body, your personal self. Right. But in a court, this is why when you walk into a court, you have to put your hand on when they, when they call your name, you walk up to the gate. Most people have never wondered, why do you have a fence and a gate in a courtroom? Oh, interesting. Yeah, well, the reason why is because on the outside where the people sit is is civil law. That's where the people, the civili in Latin, the civil, um, the civilians, civilis are sitting. But when you walk past the gate, you are now under international maritime admiralty. You have just entered the bank. Oh, uh, interesting. Okay. Hmm. Consequently, when they call your name, you you put your hand on the uh, on the gate and walk through. What you have done is that you have just uh, of just by that act alone of putting your hand on that gate and opening it up. What you have done, according to the law, which incidentally you didn't know existed, mm -hmm. what you have done is you have said. Out of your own volition, of according to your own desire, you have put your hand on the gate and opened the gate, which is a which is a symbol under maritime law of you opening yourself up to the jurisdiction of maritime law. You, your upper and lower case name, which represents your body, your blood, and your person, is agreeing to become in this litigation. You are agreeing to go before the international banks to settle this. So therefore, that's why you have to sit outside of the gate until your name is called, and now you walk inside, and now you are no longer a person. You're a dead man. You are totally dead. Therefore, this is why we say that you have, quote, no standing, end quote, meaning that you have to sit down and you have to have an attorney stand for you, for you because he has, quote, Standing in law, end quote. You have no standing. Why? Because your name on the paperwork is in all capital letters, means like the, uh, like the graveyard, you are a dead person. You don't even exist. You're dead. So therefore, since you're dead, you have nothing to say. How many times have you driven by a court, uh, by a, a cemetery and people stand up and argue with you? Nobody's going to say anything to you who are buried in a, in a cemetery. So, therefore, they have not a leg to stand on, or they have no standing. Got it. Now, <sighs> uh, once you understand that and, and, and can comprehend that concept, now move on to why the, the, the judge wears the black robe. You would explain that one. Black is the color of saffron. Mm -hmm. And since the uh, the judge is now ruling in the court for the bank, where do you find banks? Banks are on both sides of a river. Oh, they uh -huh. call river banks. Plan and what does a river bank do? It directs the flow of the current of the river. And this is exactly what the judge is there to do, to direct the flow of the current sea. Because the bank is the is the... <clears throat> director of the flow of the currency or the cash flow. And so, therefore, you are now entered into maritime admiralty and you somebody's going to pay. Now, who's going to pay? Well, it depends on who wins the game or who loses the game. So it's putting the ball back in the other guy's court. 
The whole entire superstructure of law is devoted to one thing, and that's corporations and money. It has zero, nothing to do with you as an upper and lower case name. It can, they can only deal with you as a corporation. Now, if you go into court and they read out your name and you're sitting on the outside under civil law and they read your name out, <clears throat> I have seen people do this who are knowledgeable on this subject. And incidentally, I am not the world's foremost expert on this particular subject, but I'm knowledgeable enough to talk with you about it, but I'm not the expert. So there will be questions you might have that I can't answer. Okay. I'm just giving you an overall, general overall discussion of this interesting subject of words and terms. Mm -hmm. But uh, when you are called in court, people who are very knowledgeable on this, uh, which I have watched them do, they will stand and say, uh, perhaps you might be talking about me. I don't know. Let me see the paperwork. Let me see the bank's paperwork. And the, and the marshal or whoever, uh, the, the officer of the court will say, look, it is your name John Brown or isn't it? I just called John Brown. Is that you? And that person said, no, I don't know for sure. It could be. I'm not sure. Show me the paperwork. Mm -hmm. So they just walk over and shows you the papers, uh, the subpoena or whatever, the paperwork that's brought you to the court. And looking at the paperwork, you see your name in all capital letters. Uh -huh. The person would then say to the marshal, no, I am sorry, I made a mistake. This is not me. I thought it might possibly be me, but it isn't me. Because it wasn't an upper and lower case. That's exactly right. Because I, my body, my person, this, into, this person that you're seeing standing in front of you, uh -huh. this is a living entity. That my I'm not mother dead, gave birth to. <laughs> and consequently, this law it only applies to corporations, uh -huh. and I do not choose to be a corporation. I choose to represent myself in upper and lower case. So you talk to me. Don't talk to me as if I were a company. Uh -huh. And consequently, the judge will then say, all right, we know now that you understand how this trick is played. So we will have you come back in, say, a couple of weeks, and we'll adjust the paperwork for you because you know what this means, so we'll adjust it for you. So you don't get off the hook. No, you don't get you off the get hook. Delayed. They know that you know uh -huh. what the law is. So, so let me things. ask you, if what you're saying is true, then how far up the ladder is this common knowledge? If you were going to go to law school, if you uh, were a judge, do they all know this? They just don't tell their clients this unless asked? Where does, how far does this go down? For the most part know this, but attorneys are not, most attorneys are trained under civil law, and consequently, most attorneys study to do one thing. They do not study to know the law. Uh, this is a misunderstanding, but that's all right. America misunderstands a lot. Attorneys do not go to college and study law. They go to study the system that oh, operates which we call law. It they don't a, get direct access to the law, which you're saying is written in a very different way than they're taught. Exactly. They just go to learn how to work the system. That's exactly right. Hmm. And consequently, they are told, look it, you are an officer of the court. Once you become an attorney, you're an officer of the court. Meaning, we're going to, tr it's like uh, when you become an attorney, it's right. like saying, look it, we're going to hire you as a salesman for for uh, for General Motors or Sears and Roebuck or, or any other large corporation. You don't need to know what the boss's business is. You don't need to understand who we're doing banking with. You don't need to understand anything. We'll give you a, all, a manual for training that we write ourselves. All you need to know is what we tell you you need to know, and that is how to sell the product, how to put the money in the cash register, and how to uh, balance out in the, every evening. That's right. all you need to know. Now, if you want to, you want a job, or don't you? Now, if you want to get clever and start talking to the uh, to the president of the company after hours and finding fault with the way he runs his corporation, then you're not going to have a job here very long. You just do what you've been trained to do. Okay, question. So the person who said, "I'm not this corporation. I'm not the person on this paper because it's all caps, and I'm an upper and lower case kind of guy," That's right. goes away, and then they adjust the paperwork. So then they subpoena him again, or whatever. Yes. Summons him with an upper and lower case. Now, right. do different laws apply? No, no. Now here's what's going to happen. 
you will come back to the court, because I've seen this happen, and there is your name now all neat and orderly, upper and lower case. And now the, the judge is smiling and grinning because he knows he has you now. Because you knew, as well as he did, that it, he doesn't have anything as long as your name is on all capital. But now that you know, and he knows, he has changed the paperwork for you, and now it's upper and lower case name. Now he's got you. However, the law says, maritime law says, any time, period, any time, you use a name upper and lower case on a piece of business, it must, by law, must be followed by an A.K.A., also known as. And then the name must be in all capital letters because no law in this country applies to you, period. Therefore, if you're going to use the upper and lower case name, which is you, then you're going to have to have attached to that an A.K.A., which is also known as the upper case. The all capital letters name. So it's just saying we know that you're this this piece of property, but you may think of yourself, and we're going to attach you with this AKA. All right. So then what happens? Then, then even what even happens? More vengeance? Then what happens? The judge will say, "All right, is your name now spelled correctly?" And you have to say, "Yes, that is my name." Now you've got me. However. According to the law, all laws, all federal laws, state laws, no one, and that is no one, can get an AKA on your name but you. Oh. No one. Interesting. I cannot walk into the county court of records in your city and ask for an AKA. I want to do business as, or also known as, Laura Lee. Mm hmm because they're going to say, well, where's your identification to show me who you really are as opposed to who you want to be? And consequently, it would be a, a very serious offense for me to get an AKA using your name. Okay, so the court can't really do it, or the That's judge, right. or who these lawyers. So then exactly. what? Exactly. Then you can say to the judge, as, this, as these people did that I saw, mm -hmm. who got me an AKA without telling me, because whoever did that is going to jail. Mm -hmm. Because you can't do that. Because no one can get me an AKA and use my name and sign my name to an affidavit saying that I want an AKA without my express written permission signed by me. And I have to pay the $20 to get the AKA. No one told me I had an AKA. No one asked me for that. No one uh, legally. No one inquired of me if, if I wanted an AKA, therefore someone has committed a felony. Mm -hmm. Someone's going to jail because they use my name on this document unlawfully. I am not an AKA. I am not all capital letters. Thank you. I am upper and lower case. If you can get me any kind of a piece of paper that has my name upper and lower case by itself of its own with no AKA, now you've got me. Mm -hmm. And the judge will say, we cannot do that. It is impossible. Under law, no one, no one can be held if it's upper and lowercase name. We have to have an all capital letters. Then I would say to the judge, well, I'm sorry. Adios. Goodbye. And so your friend did that? Oh, yeah. I've seen many people do that. Oh. And the judge cannot do anything. So the lawsuit the law. or the summons or whatever is dropped? The whole thing is dropped because that's the law. If you... You cannot, be, unless you want to press it, if the judge wants to press it, he knows whoever he sent to get the AKA is going to jail. He uh -huh. knows that. I know that. Uh -huh. So consequently, they have played out their hand, and you played out yours, and they've come to the end of the line, and then they say, just throw this case out. Uh -huh. Next case. Now, that's just one of many ways in which uh, our End game is, played. is used. Incidentally, uh I, I'll go back to that idea about the judges in black robes, and black was a color associated with the planet Saturn. Now, that's a whole new subject, and that's worthy of about two programs on its own, just talking about the planet Saturn okay. and how it influences our institutions of government, religion, education, sciences today. And how far back does this go, this yeah, fascination this, this with Saturn? The Saturnalian influence in uh, men's affairs 
goes all the way back to Phoenicia, Cana, uh, probably to Samaria before that, but uh, it was perfected in what we call Phoenicia or Cana. Um, it was very prominent in Egypt, uh, extraordinarily prominent in Rome, uh, very heavily involved in, uh, in Eastern and, and Europe in general. And, of course, today our country is just flooded with the influence of the planet Saturn. How so? Well, Saturn was referred to in the old Phoenician Canaanite language. You know, in the Bible we're told that the Jews went into the land of Cana. Mm -hmm. Cana is what we today refer to as Israel. Israel, Lebanon, uh, today was many thousands of years ago referred to as Cana, the land of Cana. And in the land of Cana, which is in Palestine, before Hebrews were ever there, uh, those people, those people living in that area, had their own religion, of course, and their own deities and their own ancient gods. And their primary god in the land of Cana was the planet Saturn. <clears throat> and Saturn was officially given the color of black or assigned the color of black. He was referred to as the black planet or okay. the black Sun. And, and uh, was refers directly Mars to was the planet. red sun on the red planet. Um, Venus was green. This is why the Islamic world has green in their flags because of Venus. Uh, that's why the crescent and the star and the crescent in the Islamic world on their flags is the star and the crescent. The star is the morning star, star of the morning or the star of the east or eastern star. And the crescent is the crescent of the planet Venus, not the moon. And uh, this is why uh, the ancient peoples associated the color green with Venus. Mm -hmm. And this is why, as I said, today in the Islamic countries, green is a very important color. Now, what's green got to do with Venus? What's the well, anyway, let's go back to black because that, that's, that's germane to what we were talking about, the quartz. Black right. was assigned to the planet Saturn. And Saturn was called the black sun or the black planet. Uh, therefore, the priests of Saturn would wear black robes. They were the Saturnalian priesthood. Uh, incidentally, in the Phoenicia Cana, long before the Hebrews ever got there, um, the symbol for the planet Saturn, the official theological symbol mm -hmm. that we have found through excavations, I'm saying we, the world of uh, Archaeology has found many, many temples in the, what we today call Israel, which date back far before Israel to the old ancient Phoenician Canaanite times. Mm -hmm. And in those uh, meeting places of worship, they have found the planet Saturn with the rings around it. Oh, wow. Why, incidentally, uh, women are told to listen to their god, the planet Saturn, with the, the god of rings, and this is why you wear an ear ring. Mm -hmm. Men were told to get married before their father, uh, Saturn, uh, the god of rings. So you wear a wedding ring. Uh, crown, the kings were crowned by Saturn, god uh, Saturn, so therefore you wear the round crown. Uh, you wear earrings, men's wedding rings. Rings go back to the ring of Saturn, the old ancient god of the Phoenician Canaanite. But uh, anyway, the the... Planet Saturn was officially um, designated a particular symbol, which all gods have symbols and emblems of their godship. And Saturn's uh, symbol in the old ancient digs that we're finding um, was two triangles interlaced, one going up and one pointing down, coming together. Oh, the star it was David. called the Star of Saturn or Saturn's Star. And today we call it the Star of David, but it's a six-pointed hexagram. A six-pointed hexagram was called the Star of Saturn. It was the official insignia of the god called Saturn. Uh, Saturn, as I said, was black, so therefore the priesthood of Saturn wore black robes. Uh, this is why even today... Um, <coughs> Priests and uh, priests wear black robes, and judges wear black robes, and and then universities and colleges usually, when kids uh, graduate from college or high school or whatever, they wear a black robe. Why? It's because of the priesthood of Saturn, Saturnalian priesthood, which dominated education, schools, colleges, banks, all 
uh, institutions of uh, of the you know of of man's world. This is why when your children graduate from high school or college today, they still wear the black robe, the same black robe that the judge wears, the same black robe the Catholic priest wears. Um, and Saturn, incidentally, yeah. when the Hebrews moved into that area called Cana, they encountered this god, Saturn. <clears throat> but by that time, the name of Saturn um, was given the word or the name was, how should I say this? The Hebrew term for Saturn was El, E-L, El. Oh. So the Phoenician Canaanites would call their god Saturn whatever they called him, but the Hebrews call him El. And El gives us uh, the basis for so many words that are used in court today. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Like what? For instance, uh, you get, uh, if you were a worshiper of the planet El or the planet Saturn, if you were an official in that religion, you were referred to as, uh, even as an elder uh-huh. <clears throat> because you are worshiping El. Therefore, uh-huh. you're an elder in the church. Uh-huh. Um, how did you get to be an elder? The same way you get into anything. You get El elected. Uh-huh. How did you get El elected? Well, now that you are El elected, you are now one of the El elites. Okay. You're an El elite because you were El elected. Um, how did you get all of that? <clears throat> how did all of this come about? Well, you had the juice that makes things happen. We refer to it today as electricity because it's the juice, the flow, the current, see, the current. Uh-huh. This is why you divide churches uh, into different denominations. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a play on words and terms. And only if you've spent some 40 years studying the world of the occult and terms and words and understanding how these symbols work, mm-hmm. uh, will it begin to make sense to you? Now, I'm aware. I need to take a break, actually, Jordan. And Say I just again? want to say, I need to take a break. Okay. And um, if I were to look up in the dictionary that takes me back through the etymology of various words, they wouldn't give me something to do with the Greek and, and L. Uh, there wouldn't be other origins. Well, just look up, L. Look up L in any good biblical reference work or any good mm-hmm. encyclopedia or dictionary or whatever. Okay. And um, I want to mention that we need to end this hour, and Jordan will do a second hour with us. And I've got a request from a listener. He wants you to explain the sun, S-O-N, and the sun, S-U-N, of God, and he, how he says, how you say, religious texts were changed and they used to be astrological. If we could delve into that. And as you finish up the Saturn stuff, you said there's a lot to it. Um, Jordan has books and videos. We have a link to his website. You can find them. And you can call the radio bookstore as well at 800-243-1438. Find out about his uh, video. I'm Lily. Hello there, I'm Laura Lee. Thanks for tuning in to Conversation for Exploration. Jordan Maxwell's here. He delves into today's institutions, religions, law, um, and he looks at their very ancient origins. And uh, by the way, we have a link to his website. He's also got a video the radio bookstore carries at 800-243-1438 and lots of other uh, books and source materials. And uh, Jordan, welcome back. Thank you, Laura. You last told us about uh, maritime law and maritime admiralty law, superseding civil law. You told us about uh, L and uh, its relation to Saturn. I always heard as, of L as being a substitute word for God, um, that it was used as a substitute, so you wouldn't have to mention the real word, the name of God. And we also had a request from a listener to delve into one of your favorite subjects, and that is the relationship of sun, S-O-N, and sun, S-U-N, mm-hmm. in ancient terms and their meaning. And let's start there. All right. Well, let me finish off with the L quickly. Um, L is not a substitute word for God in Hebrew. Uh, actually, L is a term for the planet Saturn, who was the major god in that area called Cana and has been, of course, mutated like all words and terms in different languages, uh, picked up by different people and and applied in different ways, 
and uh, it comes down to us today. Isis was very important in the ancient world, even up into Palestine, and as far up as in, into what we would call ancient Greece, was still heavily influenced by the Egyptian religion of Isis, and uh, the spell I-S-I-S. <coughs> And um, the beginning of wisdom, uh, wisdom was, was referred to as Isis. And then with the coming of Pharaoh Akhenaten, who changed the worship of uh, Isis uh, single-handedly as Pharaoh, he changed the whole superstructure of religion in the Egyptian world. You can do that if you're Pharaoh. And, Trying to invoke uh, that monotheism and worship of the sun. Yes, and yeah. consequently the sun became known as Amen Re or Amun Ra, spelled A M E N hyphen R A. Amen Ra. <coughs> I mean, we still use those terms today in church um, because the Egyptians said nobody can see God, but you can see his offspring, his son. Oh. And so consequently, uh, the offspring, his name is Amen, A M E N R R A, Amen Re. And so today we say the same thing in Christianity. No man can see God, but you can send your prayers to God through his divinely appointed Son. Um, and then at the end of the prayer, you say Amen, <clears throat> because uh, you're sending the prayer through Amen, right, God's Son, the light of the world. Uh, we're just talking about sun worship. However, going back to uh, El, um, it became known as <clears throat> El Shaddai, and in the Hebrew, if you do not want to use Yahweh, uh, because it's too holy a word that was the name of God, uh, you use uh, Adonai, and Adonai is the abbreviation, not El. Adonai is the abbreviation for God in the Hebrew tradition, and Adonai simply goes back to the old ancient god Adonis. So there's a lot of old ancient pagantry and fascination uh, with the old ancient pagan prehistoric world. There's just an awful lot we haven't been told about religion and government and all kinds of... What about the El in Israel and Elohim? Yes, well, as I said, Isis was very important uh, in the Middle East, in, in Egypt and the Middle East. And with the coming of Pharaoh Akhenaten, as I said, he changed the worship from Isis to Amun Re or Amen Ra. Now, all the Hebrews were the people. Of the Hebrews were in Egypt, uh, and they, of course, would learn about the worship of Isis. And then they were there during the transition from uh, from Isis to Amun Re R A. But um, <clears throat> well, I was going to say then they moved lasted, into the uh, Middle East. I mean, moved north into Palestine. But that only lasted what two decades. Before, uh, I'm, I'm not even sure. Before they converted back to the old uh, religion in Egypt? Such well, a short yeah, of because rain most of what we refer Akhenaten. to today as uh, both Hebrew and Christian. Yeah. When we talk about Judaism and Christianity in its modern-day form, it's actually Druidism. And Druidism can be traced back to the old Phoenician Canaanite Sumerian uh, religious establishment. Uh, but anyway, I was going to say when the when you move from uh, Egypt out of Egypt in that area north into Palestine, with a tradition in your mind of Isis and Amun Re R A, uh, and then encounter the new god El of the planet Saturn L, um, this is all that this is all that oh, the I name implies. Is Ra, is Ra El, El I S. R A and E L, the three names of the ancient god. So I, uh, you know, Israel is nothing more than Isis, Amun Re, and L, the planet Saturn. Uh, interesting. Hmm. Anyway, uh, I didn't <clears throat> now when we go on now to the question, which, uh, as I told you before, I'm fascinated with this whole subject of astrotheology. Okay. Um, why do we have the two words, S-U-N and S-O-N. Well, first of all, you need to go back to the very beginnings of the human family, and God knows how far that must be. <laughs> yeah. uh, nobody has accurately nailed it down, but I think it could be millions of years. Who knows? Yeah. 
But uh, we do know that as far back as we have any records for, which is Proto-Sumerian, <clears throat> as far back as we can go uh, to know anything with any kind of certainty, we know that the ancient peoples had a, a, a tremendous fear of a great enemy on the earth. And that great enemy that all ancient peoples feared uh, which we would refer to uh, today as the devil, the great embodiment of all that is evil. But in the ancient world, that great evil that all nations respected and all nations talked about was quite simply darkness. When the world gets dark, people become afraid. And children are still afraid of the dark. Adults, if they have any sense, are afraid of the dark, walking through a, a major city in the dark. So consequently, the dark represented all things which are evil and bad and sinister and, and corrupt and uh, harmful. And therefore, the, uh, <clears throat> the sun, obviously, to people who were living in those ancient times, uh, you know, if you've ever been out on the desert late at night, uh, especially in the winter, and... Uh, know how freezing cold it is and how absolutely hostile to uh, to human life it can be out on the desert late at night when it's absolutely freezing and the predator animals come out at night to eat uh-huh. and uh, you are you know you are nothing Vulnerable. more than a sitting meal for some animal oh, yeah. uh, therefore you can appreciate that the ancient mankind feared the darkness, and they feared all the evil that lurked at night when the animals and the snakes and whatever came out at night. You couldn't sleep very well because there might be a spider or you know, a scorpion or something, so the nighttime was very fearful. And so, therefore, uh, you know, night was always guided over, and, and uh, the, the god of night was always the prince of darkness. <clears throat> because it does get dark at night. And consequently, all peoples waited, all mankind waited each morning for the sun to come up. But when the sun would rise, it would give the world back warmth and light. It would bring energy. It would energize plants and animals and food so that we could get the energy from the sun and have food to eat. Well, also remember uh, there were no electric lights to switch on. That's true. No television, the no nice warm homes. Uh, there's merely the cold desert, and uh, so consequently, the sun became the symbol in the ancient and prehistoric world of the most wonderful gift that God has given to us. The most wonderful gift that God has ever provided for us is the sun, obviously. Mm -hmm. because if there was no sun, you wouldn't be here. So therefore, it was understood that the sun was your risen Savior. And of course, the sun is your risen Savior. If you don't think so, wait till it don't come up. Consequently, it was only your Savior if it rises. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful gift if it comes up, but if it don't come up, we're dead. <clears throat> so therefore, the sun became our risen Savior, who chased away the great evil of darkness, or the, quote, prince of darkness. And uh, <clears throat> from there, we're talking about Sumeria now, from there you can begin to put together the whole religion that eventually became known as Judaism and Christianity. And Christianity is nothing more than the old telling of the oldest ancient story of the world, the war between goodness and bad, the war between God and the evil, the war between light and darkness. Uh, God's Son, the light of the world, and of course the Son is the light of the world. And he is always constantly doing battle with the uh, prince of darkness. And consequently, the ancient people said that the Son does not belong to anyone. <clears throat> it's not owned by anyone on this earth. And everyone knew that. So who did it belong to? Well, it belonged to God who created it, obviously. So therefore, it was God's son, not ours. 
So God's Son was, of course, the light of the world. He was our Savior, our risen Savior. And uh, what's interesting, uh, as I said, I done, I can do four to six hours on this one subject. It's, the whole subject is referred to as astrotheology. So where do you go in those four to six hours? What kind of uh, material do you touch on? What I, I cover all of the words and terms that are used in Judaism, that are used the concepts and ideas which are reflected in the Old and New Testament, where they came from, in the entire New Testament. It takes me about two and a half hours to three hours just to do the New Testament alone, where you explain and show pictures so that you can understand, intellectually understand what's being said in the Bible. Uh, why does the sun walk on water? Well, of course, you go out at 6 o'clock in the evening and uh, <clears throat> on the Pacific and watch the sun when it's walking on water. Oh, when it's sitting right there in the horizon of an ocean? Well, of course. And so consequently, uh, when the sun comes up each morning, uh, he was our risen Savior, but he doesn't belong to us. He belongs to God. So God's, uh, it's God's offspring. And so it's the offspring of God, and consequently it becomes God's son, not ours. Mm -hmm. And all the ancient peoples realized that the sun was giving off energy, obviously. And consequently, since the sun is giving off energy, energy is, in point of fact, def defining energy as life. Because without energy, there is no life. So therefore, the sun is giving energy, which is providing us with life. And that's and scientifically factual today. Okay, so you're suggesting that the earliest peoples were talking and using terms and phrases to describe the sun, the physical star that lights right. our world. Mm -hmm. And somehow along the way, it got uh, confused with or, or um, paralleled with talking about a person, a human. Of course. Tell us about that transition. <clears throat> well, um, uh, Lord, I've, I've got a... Uh, is it just a hand? That's, that's interesting. Uh, story, as I said, the whole story is called Astral Theology, and, and when confronted with uh, telling the story, I think, well, do we have four hours where I can sit down and start at square one? Because it's... Yeah, about it's 45 a, minutes. Okay. It's an interesting... Uh, once you get the hang of it, once you start looking uh, and, and understanding the, the code in the Bible, there's a Bible code. Heavens, there's all kinds of Bible codes. This is not referring but to oldest, like every third or every tenth no, letter. Well, that's, that's one way of looking at a code. But the kind of code I'm talking about are terms and words. <clears throat> now, for instance, uh, let, me, let me go through this because uh, this will give you an idea about where to start. On the first day of summer, uh, incidentally, all of our religious concepts and ideas in the Anglo-Saxon um, English-speaking world and most of uh, the rest of the world, uh, all of our religious concepts and ideas, no matter what country, have come from the northern hemisphere, not the southern hemisphere, northern hemisphere. Okay. Consequently, on the first day of summer, the first day of summer is referred to as the summer solstice. The sun is in the northern hemisphere, as high and as far north as it's going to get. It's directly overhead in the northern hemisphere. And consequently, on the first day of summer, the sun is as high in the northern hemisphere as it's going to go. It's not going to go any further north. However, each day the sun moves one degree southward. But the move is so slight that no one even notices it. But it's moving each day one degree southward till it finally hits fall. And for the first time, it finally occurs to you or it dawns on you that the sun has moved southward in the sky halfway down. And now the, the trees are starting to be affected because they're not getting the energy. So the the, 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 the leaves are turning colors, and it's become fall and, and autumn. That's because the sun, which was northern in the northern hemisphere, uh, is now moving southward, and it's about halfway gone. Now we start getting colder and shorter evenings, uh, shorter days and longer evenings of darkness, 
And uh, then the sun keeps moving southward until it hits the lowest point in the southern sky. And this is on December 22nd. And now it is as low in the southern sky as it's going to go. And that's on December 22nd, which is the beginning, the first day of summer in the southern hemisphere. The sun has gone south. If you have the money, you need to go to Rio. All the birds are flying south. Everybody else is going south. So, you know, if you want to, if you love the sun, go down to Rio for about three months because that's where it's down. It's, the sun is down in the southern hemisphere. Yeah, we know our base now, astronomy. Uh, say it again. Nothing. Go ahead. So, therefore, now the sun has reached its lowest point in the southern sky on December 22nd. Thank God it doesn't go any lower or it will be gone completely. However, each day the sun was moving one degree. But interesting, something interesting happens to the sun on December 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. For three days the sun rises in the southern, uh, down at the southernmost tip um, in the same Degree. It does not go any further south, and it doesn't come back northward. It rises on the exact same degree for three days. That's 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. So the ancient peoples realized that the sun rose for three days right in the same degree. And they knew it's been moving either north or south, but now it's not moving at all. So they said the sun, God's sun, the light of the world, was dead for three days in his tomb. He was dead. He's not going anywhere. He's spinning his wheels. He's just not going anywhere. So he's dead. Anything that was moving all year and doesn't move at all is dead. But on the 25th, all the ancient peoples realized with their stone monuments and whatever, like Stonehenge, they realized that the sun moved one degree northward. Because the reflection on the stones showed that the sun has moved one degree Therefore, anything that was dead for three days and is now moving again has been born again. And so, therefore, the ancients celebrated the fact that the sun is now going to come back to us in the northern hemisphere. And he is now born again. So, therefore, uh, on December 25th, we still celebrate God's son's birthday or his new birth coming back to us. This is what Christmas is all about. The sun has reached its lowest point in the southern sky, and on December 25th moves one degree northward, beginning its annual journey back to the northern hemisphere. And consequently, it continues each day moving one degree northward, just like it did from the first day of summer going southward. It's now doing the same thing, coming from the south going northward. So we get these metaphors of uh, dying in a tomb for three days and then rising again. Right. Which can apply to Jesus. <clears throat> As it's moving northward uh, one degree each day, it passes over the equator. And consequently, at that moment and at that point, it becomes uh, a, a quarter of the way up. So now a half the way up. So now it has uh, brought what we call spring. All of the animals and the flowers and everything begins to uh, perk up because now they're getting the sun again. He's coming back. He said he would return, and he's returning. He's coming back again. And so in the spring, the first week of spring, all the nations of the ancient world celebrated God's son has come back to us. He's coming back. He promised he would come back, and here he is. He's coming back. And so they would celebrate. The spring, uh, they would celebrate the spring equinox. Now, in the ancient world, when you died, especially in Egypt, they said that when you died, um, we still use the same terms today. The word pass, P-A-S-S, was used to talk about people who had died. We say, Grandma, the past last night, or they passed on, or they, they passed uh, what's another term? They passed on. They passed. They passed away last night. Well, the Egyptians said that the that, that the um, when you died, you passed over from this life to the next life on the quote other side. 
Uh -huh. So you have passed over from the death, from your life, into the, 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 the world of the dead. You have passed over. And we even say that, uh, I've heard that even in my lifetime, people saying, yeah, grandmother passed over last night. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> consequently, the son, which was dead in winter, reborn on December 25th, <clears throat> has finally come up in the northern hemisphere, come toward the northern hemisphere, enough that it has passed over the equator on its way back to us, which brings our first week of spring. So the ancient peoples before Hebrews ever existed, the ancient Phoenician, Canaanites, Sumerians, Babylonians, Hittites, Assyrians, all of the ancient cultures realized that the sun was coming back to the northern hemisphere, and so they celebrated the first week of its coming back, and they called it the Passover. Passover, yeah. Because the sun was dead in winter and has come back alive and has passed over into the new life of spring. So the Passover, and of course Christians picked this up from the ancient uh, people, from the ancient Hebrews, but they couldn't have the Passover because that's a Hebrew celebration. So the Christians would have the same identical worship of the sun, but they would just call it the resurrection of God's son. And so the resurrection happens on the first week of spring, just like the Passover. <clears throat> and this is why Christians on the first day of spring or in the first week of spring go out and have uh, and celebrate something called an Easter sunrise service. They're waiting for the sun to rise over the equator because he has passed over. He has been resurrected. So this is all Christianity is. It's, uh, it's, it's a retelling of the old ancient astrotheological story of the ancient prehistoric world. Uh, most people are not aware of any of this. This is what has always amazed me, is the Christians are continually talking about all the evil pagans, never realizing their religion is the oldest pagan religion that's ever been uh, on the earth, and that is sun worship. <clears throat> and consequently, you take the, uh, the metaphor... And this is all the New Testament is. This is a symbolic metaphor. It even has God's Son, who represents the light of the world. And of course, the Son is the light of the world. Um, it has God's Son saying that many will look with their eyes, but not see, and listen with their ears, but not hear, and with their heart not get the sense of it. And the Apostle Paul said to the Christians of his day, uh, I bear you witness that you have a zeal for God, but not according to accurate knowledge. The point being is that if you're going to honor the divine presence in the universe, do it with intelligence. Understand what you're doing. Understand what the words mean. Understand and don't use your religion to, uh, to put down other people because yours is the correct religion. When in point of fact, all, A-L-L, -L, all religions go back to the old ancient astrotheology, astrological story going all the way back to day one, back to Sumeria, Babylonia, Phoenicia, Cana, the Hittites, the Sumerians. All of this is a very ancient story that's been retold, and this is why the Bible is called the greatest story ever told. It's not the greatest collection of facts the world's ever known. It's the greatest story ever told. It's a story. Okay, but there's so many details to the life of Jesus that sure you can find some parallels with uh, worship of the actual star, our sun. But can you, how do you explain all these others? And are you discounting the whole existence of the life of Jesus or just that through accretion other uh Stories would parallel his because they're right there in the in the old uh, the old stories. Well, that came before. We have to uh, take a break before you answer that. So no, I, I, I yeah. I, I should take a break. So Paul, is this our half hour break? And we'll come right back with Jordan Maxwell and Laura Lane.
Laura Lee Online. www.lauralee.com. All interviews on the Laura Lee Show are available on audio cassette. For information, call 1 800 243 1438. The sweet secret of the herb stevia lies in a complex molecule called steviocide, a glycoside composed of glucose, sulfurose, and steviol, a complex molecule that gives this herb from Paraguay its extraordinary sweetness, 10 to 15 times sweeter than common table sugar. But here's the really extraordinary part. Stevia does not affect blood sugar metabolism. Some studies even report that stevia reduces plasma glucose levels in normal adults. Sweet, nutritious, natural, and good for you. Wisdom of the Ancients introduces Stevia Plus. Take these little packets with you everywhere, containing powdered stevia that equals two teaspoons of sugar and sweetness. Sprinkle on food and beverages alike. I use stevia daily. Add the liquid concentrate to lemon juice and water, and you have refreshing lemonade, and decarbonated water for a soda substitute. Stevia makes any herbal tea taste sweeter and better. Stevia is good for your skin, too, applied externally. Try it. It's versatile, good for you, and sweet without the calories. Wisdom of the Ancient Stevia products are the highest quality available. Call 1-800-243-1438. We all try to watch our diet to get a balance of nutrition, but that's not always possible. There's a gap between the nutrition from the average American diet and the optimum diet for the human system. The challenge is to take care of our own health while being able to enjoy comfort foods. That's why nutritionist and biochemist Udo Erasmus developed Missing Link. It bridges this gap with foods naturally high in essential nutrients, trace minerals, vitamins, and fiber. Call 1-800-243-1438. Missing Link is a powder that you sprinkle on your food, making your food taste better, and three tablespoons daily is all you need to achieve optimum nutrition. Call 1-800-243-1438. Each bag contains a one-month supply and is only $19.95. Call 1-800-243-1438. Laura Lee here on The Laura Lee Show. We continue our conversation with Jordan Maxwell, and uh, Jordan's been explaining some interesting parallels between ancient worship of our star, the sun, and the story of uh, Jesus. Um, So where do you place the story of of Jesus and all the other details that come up with it? How do you see it, Jordan? Well, as I said, I do a four-hour seminar in which I start with uh, Matthew and walk all the way through the Bible and show you the overwhelmingly obvious that uh, unless someone points it out to you, it's like an optical illusion. It's like uh, looking at these new kind of artwork, this computerized artwork. It's nothing but a blur. Oh, and until you adjust your eyes and then it jumps off the page at you in 3D. And and that's exactly what... uh, what the whole like. world of learning is like. I mean, you could sit and look at a law library and have no idea in the world what you're looking at, you know. I mean, where does it all start? Where does it all come from? I mean, well, uh, take 40 years of your life like I have and sit down and study for the next 40 years and figure it out. Um, and then when you do, what you are also going to discover once you have got a, a handle on it and know where it came from, now you're going to discover that virtually nobody knows what you're talking about. Why? Because they haven't sat with you for the past 40 years. They have no idea in the world what you're doing. And consequently, uh, you know, you sound like a fool because uh, nobody knows what you're talking about. It's lonely, doesn't it? Yeah, you know, it's, you know I can appreciate, um, you know, the Nikolai Teslas of the world and other people who try to help their fellow man to understand something that people didn't even know existed. What drives you to do this? What drive? What drove you to do for forty years? Uh, I, I, I might. Well, I guess it was because of my bloodline. Because my my family, my mother had an uncle uh, when I was growing up as a child, who worked in the Vatican Secretary of State's office. Uh, she also had, uh, which I only would see on a couple of uh, every couple of years, would come back for a brief visit. But nonetheless, he was a Vatican official, and uh, my mother also had two 
federal judges that happened to live in our hometown who were her uncles, so I grew up with federal judges. And my great-grandfather, my mother's grandfather, was a senator from the state of Florida who died in office because he was too powerful and they couldn't get him out. And so I have um, <clears throat> I have politics and religion in my blood. I was born and raised Catholic. Uh, we were a very Catholic family. Uh, but I was always asking questions, always as a child. I got myself in trouble. Uh, I, the first official trouble I got myself into uh, was at confirmation when I was nine years old, ten years old. Uh -huh. uh, we were told at confirmation that when the bishop, uh, after the ceremonies in the church were over, uh, the bishop will ask if anyone has a question. Uh, the young people have questions to ask their bishop, and, and we were told by the nuns, do not ask any questions, period. You just sit and keep your mouth shut. So the night of the big event, uh, after the ceremonies were over, and the bishop did say just that, he said, well, now that we have the new Catholic children, uh, confirmed, um, are there any questions? And I stood up, and because I was always arrogant, I stood up and said, yes, I, I have a question. Uh -huh. I said, my father works with the uh, torches like a welder. I said, could I take my, one of my dad's torches and burn an angel? If there was an angel next to me, could I take a torch and burn him? What a question. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, the, and the bishop says, well, no, whatever, what would make you think you could? I said, well, I'm just asking. I don't know. And he said, well, no, you cannot take a torch and burn an angel. And I said, why not? He said, well, because angels are spirits. You can't burn a spirit. Yeah. It, you know, fire is a natural phenomenon like wood or paper or something, but you can't burn a spirit. And I said, well, if I can't burn a spirit, why am I concerned about going to hell where my spirit's going to burn forever if you can't burn a spirit? And so that was <laughs> I the first was time I, uh, I got a stiff talking to and told, never to open your mouth again. I well, see. Hell's got no uh, <laughs> no cachet here because you can't burn anyway. Right. Yeah. So, so consequently, I, I it, it didn't take me very long growing up listening to my uncles who were federal judges and and I hung around uh, the the church and priest and all kinds of interesting people and the mayor and and uh, I got a feeling and a sense for government and for religion and for law etc. At the ripe old age of 17 and a half, when I left home, I pretty well had heard all the stories. Wow. And all so that kind I, of stuff? Is this the kind of stuff that, that you'd sit around the dinner table at night with certain select members of your family and talk about? Mm-hmm. All this stuff, the ancient symbology and where it came from. And yeah, yeah. And, wow. And uh, most people would look at me like, uh, what is this kid talking about? And I said, you know, it's history. Go to the library. Read a book. It's history. How are we uh, able to do this and not have to go and get regular work? That we say that again. How are you able to devote 40 years to studies and sitting in libraries and reading all this and not get a regular job? Yeah, I know. I know. That's what my wife said. Lucky guy. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody can pull that off and sit in the libraries and do what you've done. Well, let me tell you, I, um, I, I lost everything because of it. I lost my home. I lost my marriage. I lost my wife. I lost everything I ever owned in this world, and um, so, I mean, that's the way the universe is. You want something bad enough, it may allow you to have it, but if you're going that's to have right. that, then you've got to pay something. You, you know, it's, um, you've got to pay for whatever it is you do. Well, I paid a hell of a price for the kind of knowledge and the kind of work that I have done all my life. Uh, am I happy about that? I don't think so. I don't know that it was, um, I don't know that it was worth it. I mean, I now can sit and sit before large audiences at huge universities and discuss uh, intelligently with huge audiences all kinds of fascinating uh, knowledge and materials that most people have never been privileged to know anything about. And I do that. I travel around the world speaking to audiences, and I know that people are sitting there with uh, glassy eyes having no idea in the world what I'm talking about. So... In one one way, I got what I wanted. I wanted wisdom and knowledge. Uh, the other, though, I paid a terrible price for it, and um, I'm not sure I did the right thing because uh, ignorance is bliss. You're far more happier when you don't know half of the things that are going on. But that's my life. That's who I am, and so I accept it, and it's far too gone now to you, change. Now I just study every day, read and study every day, and... Uh, 
and and I am also happy that I am in the company of uh, very, almost daily in the company of other writers, authors, lecturers, teachers, scientists. I'm a member of organizations, physicist, uh, national, international physicist organizations, international research societies. Um, so I not only do my own homework, but I'm just dazzled by the brilliance of other people and their work. Um, and so the more I learn, the more I know how much I don't know. It's just a fascinating world, and that's why I can't understand anyone who would tell me that life is boring. Life is boring because you're not doing anything. You know, if you knew what the world was all about and understood some of the ancient mysteries of the world and, and some of the most profound, uh, you know, knowledge that's sitting in front of us, and we don't even see it. I mean, we haven't even figured out uh, you know, where the Aztecs went, yes. And all of the ancient pyramids and great temples around the world, and who built all of these great monuments and the Nazca lines in, in Peru, and God knows and we can sit and talk for hours about all the ancient mysteries of the world. And what's going on in, in, uh, in the Atlantic Ocean and Bermuda Triangle? Is there anything going on? <clears throat> well, you might not think so, but the United States Navy thinks so. And they're very concerned about it. I don't know if you know anything about it, but they know it. They may not know about it, and they're very concerned about it. What do you think? Consequently, I'm just saying that when you go to a court, you're going to go into government, you're going to step into the halls of power. You really need to know what's been going on on the earth while you were asleep. <laughs> uh, you know, this is a fantastic world we live in. And uh, the more you begin to delve into it, the more you begin to see how much you didn't know. Uh, let me go back to this thing about the uh, Easter or the uh, worship of the sun. <clears throat> In the ancient uh, Phoenician Canaanite world, which we today refer to as Israel, that area Israel and Lebanon was known as Cana, that area of the world celebrated uh, uh, the first week of spring like everyone else did. The name of their celebration was called the Marriage Feast of Cana. And we're told about the Marriage Feast of Cana in the Bible. That's a metaphor. It's a symbolic story, a symbolic metaphor. Because if you understand that the Marriage Feast was the Marriage Feast of uh, Cana was a metaphor for the sun coming back in spring, then you begin to see how the story unfolds. It's fascinating. Um, as I said, the sun comes back, it crosses the equator, it has now passed over into its new life in spring. Consequently, um, it has, this also has to do, uh, this marriage feast of Cana has to do with why we call God the Father. Oh, okay. Uh, why is God necessarily the Father? Uh, I've often wondered, maybe God is also a female, because the Bible says he, uh, God created man in his own image, male and female. Uh -huh. So why do we call it Mother God, Mother Goddess? Well, so maybe God is both male and female. Uh, maybe he's neither one. Yeah. Maybe the whole thing is a metaphor. But um, <clears throat> anyway, the reason why we call God the Father is because of rain. That's why we call God the Father. It's What's because of rain. Uh, R-A-I-N is not the word for water falling from the heaven. R-A-I-N is a very ancient word for God, a name of the most ancient God in the Hindu language. In the Hindu, one of the most ancient gods of the Hindus, and I do mean ancient, <clears throat> his name was Rain, R-A-I-N. And this is why we use that term in our Anglo-Saxon. We have adopted that word of the God named rain. We call it rain when water falls from heaven. Because the ancient people said that when in the spring, Mother Earth was impregnated by God the Father because the, the, uh, the sacred fluid from heaven came and impregnated Mother Earth, oh, Mother okay. Nature. I see. Consequently, Mother Nature was impregnated by who? Well, and obviously by God the Father. Uh-huh. So God so that's the Father... that's just not raindrops falling down from that That's sky. right. And so consequently, the raindrops uh, were actually the sacred fluid coming from the Father into the female, Mother Earth. 
but you can't have that kind of activity. Now you're talking about promiscuous activity here between God the Father and Mother Earth, and you don't want something like that going on unless, of course, you're married. And so consequently you have to have uh, a marriage feast uh, to celebrate the marriage feast between God the Father and Mother Earth. And therefore the metaphor, the symbolic metaphor for spring in the ancient land of Cana, as I said, was called the marriage feast of Cana. The marriage feast was in honor of God the Father being married to Mother Earth or Mother Nature in preparation for the spring rains which were coming to impregnate Mother Nature or Mother Things Earth. would grow. Mm -hmm. And consequently, the story went something like this, symbolically, okay. that Mother Earth or Mother asked God's son, <clears throat> Mother Nature or Mother Earth, the Mother asked God's son to draw water, which the son does, it draws water, uh, and have it rain on the grapes so that we can make wine for the great marriage feast in spring when the spring weddings begin. And so you're not going to have the grapes for celebration of wine and the, the wine celebrations if, if it doesn't rain on the grapes and they don't grow. So therefore, Mother asked God's Son to draw water to uh, rain on the grapes so that you can change the grapes into wine. So what you've done is take the sun's water and uh, change water into wine. Okay, I have a I, question for you on a personal level. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's when you lay it out in pictures and you see it in the old, uh, you know, when you see pictures, the mind quickly comprehends the story better than just telling it over the uh, Oh, over you can gauge yourself very clearly. These are some fascinating parallels. What I wanted to know, Archie thinks, the ancient mindset, I mean, the real, real, real ancient one, do you believe that they saw the sun as an animate being, as they saw Mother Earth as an animate being, or were they just speaking in metaphorical terms about the natural world around them and yes. creating rituals? Excellent, excellent question, yes. Um, no nation, no people ever recognized the sun as a god, no one. Um, <clears throat> so therefore, it is actually a misnomer to say that the ancient people were sun worshippers. In point of fact, the ancient peoples all realized the sun was a divine uh, gift to the universe and to our world. But they didn't confuse them with God. But it was no. not a living uh, God. It represented all of the qualities that obviously God would have, all of the wonderful life, qualities and life. powers mm -hmm. that God would exercise and have was obviously represented symbolically by the sun. First, God is obviously brilliant. Well, the sun is brilliant. Uh, God is also the creator of all life and the sustainer of all life. Well, that's what the sun does. It creates and, and sustains all life. And uh, it brings warmth and happiness. Uh, it chases away the boogeyman of darkness. And so it chases away the evil prince of darkness. That's what God does. It provides food for mankind. It provides uh, warmth and protection. Right. Uh, so and so all of, of the wonderful qualities that God obviously has would be uh -huh. symbolically okay. represented in the sun. So even you're suggesting the ancients knew it was just a symbolic language because yes. we do that today. We anthropomorphize everything around us. It just helps us relate well, to it better. Does. It makes it easier to talk about. Okay, next question for you. As you grew up a Roman Catholic, um, and I don't know if you ever believed it, it, considering the question that you had, you were testing it when you were little, and you're still testing it now, uh, although I think you've broken free. Um, so you look at this and you've demystified it. You're saying, well, maybe there aren't spiritual beings. Maybe there aren't angels. Maybe there aren't these this whole metaphysical world of spirit, but it's just a misunderstanding well, that we've I'm come just, down to. Or where are you on this question? I'm just oh, asking I'm, you personally. I'm so delighted that you asked that question because I, it wouldn't, wouldn't have occurred to me to bring it up, but I'm glad you did. Because I want to establish, uh, I have the highest of respect for spiritual uh, spirituality. I am a total committed to, I am totally committed to the concept that there is a divine presence in the universe that men have called God. 
I have no problem whatsoever with that idea of a divine presence or a, uh, or a divine, or, uh, how would you say, I, I don't see it as a man or as a... Neither do I, as a creator, whatever it is. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a divine uh, creating presence in all things, in the, in the animal life, in the vegetable life, in the life of the universe, there's a breathing, a breathing in of energy and a breathing out. We can see stars coming into being, uh-huh. stars dying, people being born, people leaving. Uh, there is a divine presence in all things I have the highest of respect for. Okay. And so in that way, I could say that I am a totally a believer in God or a total believer in the divine principles of the universe. Are you then trying to free us, you fellow human beings, from erroneous, limited ideas of God? Yes. That's basically what I'm trying to do. You're not sitting there on a throne, you know, up in the sky? Yeah. Well, what I'm doing, uh, I should add to what I just said, the fact that I have no problem whatsoever with uh, the idea of spirits or or angels or demons or whatever you want to call them, and there's all kinds of... uh, explanations for that other world, that other world of darkness, of, uh, uh, of where you go when you die, whatever. There's all kinds of, of ideas expressed. But I am totally convinced for myself, beyond the shadow of a doubt, yeah. that there is, in, uh, in point of fact, uh, a spirit world. I, there, there's, there's no doubt in my mind about it. So what convinces you? Uh, and so, therefore, I don't know if I would call them angels, necessarily. I don't know if I would call them uh, demons, but I do believe that there is a, a presence, a spiritual, divine presence, uh, which they, they meaning whoever they are, are able to um, come in and go out of dimensions. So I don't have any problem with the idea of angels. I, I'm quite sure that they're here. Mm-hmm. I'm quite sure that maybe uh, there's all kinds of spirit entities in this world that we don't see necessarily, but we will see face to face on occasions. Uh-huh. Like the Apostle Paul said, some have entertained angels unaware and didn't even know it. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I mean, how many stories have we heard in in our lifetime? How many thousands of stories of people who? Uh, who were caught in a terrible accident or, or some terrible tragedy. Oh, miracles that happened. Yeah, and someone walked in out of nowhere yeah. and helped them and, and, and protected them and then walked out and were gone and were never seen again. Do you have a spiritual practice that you do, Jordan? Say it again? Do you have a spiritual practice that you do? Uh, not... To put you in touch with that realm or... No, I, 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 I'm a very spiritual person. I read and I study. I, uh, I communicate with uh, with the spirit world in my own way. Uh, but I have a very high respect for the entire superstructure of, of what we would call God and the spirit world. Do you pray? I have a very high respect for. I'm not a fool. I, I understand the difference between metaphor. But I also know that there's something else going on besides the metaphor. And that's, uh, you know, that, that I, I have a high respect for. What do you think, um, I mean, your mission is to wake people up and say, gee, look at our history and what these ancients were really uh, looking at and look at how we're expressing religion today or law. What would you hope if you could, you know, take a a Sin City computer program and redesign the world? Under what lines? What would you test out? What would you... I would like to see the entire world. This is merely... uh, in answer to your question, but I would like to see the entire world for the first time sit down and listen to the whole story of the ancient mystery schools, the ancient mystery school teachings of astral theology and the secret teachings of all the ancient ages of the world, what the ancient peoples were trying to tell us, what do the Aztecs and the Mayas and Incas know that we are too brilliant to even look at. We're too smart. To, uh, I think that what we have had are people who have purposely kept us ignorant so that we don't uh, bother to look at what the Egyptians were really teaching, what they really believed, and why they believed it. Uh, I think that there are some very, very intelligent and powerful people in the world 
who know that there was a huge and a humongous story going on on the, on the in the world for thousands of years, uh, but it's not on a need to know basis for you. I mean, you don't need to know. You just go on and do your job. And is it too empowering to know? Yeah, I think it's very empowering, and I think that's exactly the problem: is that the people in power do not want you to know how much power you really have once you get in touch with your own spiritual connection with God and get your own spiritual connection, all of a sudden you don't need anyone. You don't need to crawl on your knees to government. You don't need to have anyone tell you how to act and how to think and how to treat your fellow man, how to treat your mate in marriage. You don't need anyone to tell you any of these things. And therefore you, uh, you become a light in yourself, and people then begin to see that you are, are a brilliant person, that you live your life with profound wisdom and knowledge, and you you move in such a way as to show that you are a, a well-adjusted and, and have respect for uh, other people, respect for belief systems, respect for the universe. Uh, today, unhappily, mankind has no respect for themselves, much less the earth or their wife or their husband or anything else. They don't even have respect for themselves. Well, certainly that message that you expressed has been kept damped down because it was threatening to former um, leaders of the world, that, you know, those who had had it by its grip. But I, I keep wondering if we can afford to do that anymore today. I think you're right. Take us all down with the ship, you know? I mean, I, I totally think you're right. I don't think we can continue to play dumb anymore. I think we... Nobody, I mean, even children, you will see it in all children. No no child wants to be chastised by the parent or by the teacher. No one wants to be told, sit down and be quiet, you know, you're out of line. Uh, nobody likes that. Nobody likes to be made fun of in front of the class and made to look like a, a you know, fool, even though you act like a fool and therefore you got chastised. But nobody likes that. Humans do not like to be put down. They like to take the front seat and be pompous and arrogant. And then when someone comes in with real authority and says, go sit in the back, you're not capable of sitting up here within, with us, that, no one likes that. So consequently, yeah. that's in part of human nature. We don't want to know that we've been wrong. We don't want to hear that. All we want to know is that what we believe to be true is true. That's all we want to hear. Well, now, if you can come in, if you can come in and show people, say, in any particular religion or any particular philosophy, be it Democrat, Republican, whatever, and if you can show people that what they believe to be true is absolutely flawlessly true, and you can articulate that in such a way as to dazzle them with your brilliance, they're going to support you. They're going to love you. Because why? They, you are telling them what they want to hear. And this is exactly what in professional and uh, good people who know how to manipulate audiences, uh, this is what they do. They will tell you exactly what you want to hear. And then go off and do something else entirely. Exactly. <laughs> and then when, uh, after, they, uh, you know, after they have um, uh, made all the money off of you, uh, then they go away laughing. So what I'm saying is I think uh, you are totally right. I don't think, you know, on this Earth, we are not crew. This is a spaceship going through space, as Earth is. And we're not crew. I mean, we're not, we're not passengers, I should say. We're all crew. We're, you know, we are all responsible for this uh, beautiful creation we call our Earth and where we... And somebody has messed it up so bad and dirtied it up so bad that they now have a thing called a space shuttle. And it never occurred to anyone that a space shuttle, a shuttle, is a bus. You take a bus when you're leaving town. Somebody is trying to build a space station out there, and no one seems to know why. Oh, you're saying a safe landing, so That's that right. the whole world <laughs> crushes yeah, I think ecology? That, I think that there are some very powerful people in high places that you have never heard of and do not know anything about that they know they are many things, but they're not stupid. And they know that the earth as it is now is practically doomed. The, the people are too far gone. They're too ignorant, too, uh, too unintelligible. They, they have no respect for themselves or the land or the earth. They know that the people have uh, lost contact with their divinity and their divine presence in the universe. So if you were, you know, if you were a master 
at the top of the world, you uh -huh. would plan on leaving here because it's too far out of control. They're cutting down the trees. They're, they're cutting. You only, only have an inch of well, soil left. Well, you think that the other alternative would be to, you know, begin the education process, the waking up process. I don't know. I have one last question for you, and then, then our hour is through. Um, if you believe in angels and if you believe in metaphysical beings, then what is wrong fundamentally with the Christian message, which is that Jesus came down in order to set an example of what we could be? How could that not be? I mean, I'm open to that possibility. All right, look at What I would say in answer to that is that if you understand the Christian message, as I am telling you, it exists as a metaphor, it is a divinely beautiful and powerful story yeah. about the war between light and darkness. It's the law. It's the war between intellectual enlightenment. This is why it has Jesus say, "I am the light of the world." Uh, no one comes to the Father unless He comes through me. I think it is a beautiful story. It is a profoundly uh, deep and beautiful story about how uh, God or the Creator would want you to be enlightened. And um, I could go on. We could do another program just on astral theology. Uh -huh. of which I have you know, just touched on. We I have to wrap up this hour first. Yes, I know. So. But I am, I'm saying that I have the highest respect for the story in the Bible and the New and the Old Testament as long as you understand it's a story and it's trying to tell you something. And if you're looking the at the metaphor yeah. as actual history, you're not going to get it. Thank you for that clarification and thank you for some fascinating uh, discourse. Appreciate all the 40 years' work that you've been doing, Jordan. We have a link to Jordan's website. The Radio Bookstore has one of his many videos, and you can call them at 800-243-1438. You go check out his website. Thanks for listening to Conversation for Exploration. That was Jordan Maxwell. I'm Laura Lee.